we survey thousands of people for this. So out of a thousand active buyers, the pushback and senior leadership not understanding the technology is one of the top five reasons why technology is not getting bought and implemented in business today. Welcome back everyone to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Jason Cochran, hosting solo again today. Ira is enjoying the sunny rays of Hawaii on his birthday today. Long overdue vacation for him. We miss you, Ira, and we look forward to seeing you back in the crow's nest next week. Thank you all for being part of Googleization Nation. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We've become the voice of some of the most important, crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and convergence of business technology and people. Because of you, we are now a top 1% podcast globally in popularity. We're also ranked as a top 100 business management podcast, and we're also ranked in the top 100 for thought leadership. Thank you for listening and allowing us to do what we do with our amazing guests. This episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization is sponsored by our partners at Y Institute, your personal and professional GPS for a meaningful life and purpose-filled career. You'll hear more about the Y Operating System and the Y Institute later on in the show, including a special Y workshop that Ira and I will be doing upcoming here on February 23rd at noon Eastern time. So stay tuned for more details on that. Well, folks, the AI cat is out of the bag. In fact, think of it this way. Kids and babies now will never know of a world that existed without AI as an everyday part of our lives. It's going to define their generation. And fresh off the heels of ChatGPT's public release, Google is about to launch their own conversational AI service named BARD. Since its public launch on November 30th of 2022, so just a few months ago with ChatGPT, it reached 100 million monthly users in just two months, becoming the fastest growing consumer application in world history. Now, for reference, the previous two companies that held that title were TikTok, it took them nine months to reach 100 million users. And then before TikTok was Instagram. It took them about two and a half years. So if you thought things couldn't possibly change any faster than they already have since 2020, think again. And make no mistake, AI will likely be the most disruptive advancement that we experience in our lifetime from how we work, to how we travel, to how we age, and to even how we perceive reality. And given the growing pains that we all, including our economy, are going through to adapt to these unprecedented levels of change, what are we to make of the mass layoffs? And then another question is, how do we begin learning the skills for jobs that don't even exist yet? To help us make sense of all of this rapid change, we've got Sarah White joining us today. Sarah is the uh, founder and CEO of research firm Aspect 43, and we're going to dig into their latest research on ethical layoffs and employee experience during RIFs. But first, before we get there, it is time for our perfect labor storm segment. As you know, on each episode, we try to focus on just one disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we think you should know. So here are our perfect labor storm data for today. According to employment firm Challenger, Gray, and Christmas, U.S. employers announced, announced more than 100,000 job cuts in January alone, with tech firms accounting for 41% of the cuts. It should be noted that for 18 straight months, employers were posted uh, at least 10 million openings, a level that was never reached before 2021 in Labor Department data, going all the way back to 2000. Another layer to this is that average CEO compensation 
is now around 400 times more than the typical employee. And then lastly, according to Burning Glass Institute, there are four emerging skill sets that are providing a window into skill disruption for the future. Those four are AI and machine learning, cloud computing, product management, and social media. In fact, AI and machine learning, it's grown at a rate of 370% over the past five years. So lots of interesting stuff to chew on here as we set the table with Sarah White for today's discussion. So without further ado, let's welcome Sarah White to the Geek Skeezers Googleization Show. Hey, Sarah, how are you? Great. How are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, as you heard, we've got a lot to unpack today, don't we? We've and I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to get some answers. But as, as we get ready to dig in on this stuff, let's learn a little bit about Aspect 43 specifically and who you are and the type of research that you're doing. And then we'll get right into it. Yeah, absolutely. So Aspect 43 is focused on the future of work. And so we do a couple of different things. We do have our research group that is out and we're always trying to look and see what's happening um, and really how technology is impacting work, both from the employee side, but also from the business side. And we do, you know, there's a lot of really great HR analysts out there. One of the things that we do a little bit differently is we're trying to understand Um, why people are buying different types of technologies and what is driving them to buy versus how they're actually using it uh, and looking at what is happening and going on in the business outside of that in order to make those decisions. And then we get the privilege of getting to work with a lot of the tech companies and investors and helping them build the next generation, helping them better understand their buyer base and really connect more to the people that are actually using the technology so we can have an impact day to day on the employees. That's perfect. And I've got to imagine with all the disruption, everything that's changing right now, your research and the work that you're doing is more important than ever. And so let's dive right in. Um, I know yeah. you've got some some research that's hot off the presses, uh, in particular around um, ethical layoffs yeah. and employee experience during RIFs. So let's hop right to it. Obviously, a lot of people, what's top of mind for them is it seems like every day now in the news, we are seeing mass layoffs and it's now moving beyond just the tech companies. What can you share with us that you have learned or are learning through your research oh. on how to deal with these massive layoffs? I think one of the things that was most shocking, we started noticing uh, the trend of layoffs coming around June of last year. So in July, August, we started really focusing in on researching how companies were doing layoffs, why they were doing layoffs, and what exactly was going on for both the employees as well as the organizations that were doing them and what made the difference between how they were being done um, really focused on what was happening on social. There is a whole channel around layoffs on TikTok where it is people live streaming layoffs. They are announcing what's happening. They are sharing how much severance they're getting, what's happening. Like the it's not great for companies to put it mildly um, because most of it is not positive because a lot of companies are not handling it in a really positive way. But what we did see is a lot of trends and things that were coming through. And it wasn't even the fact that they did layoffs that upset most of the people that were getting laid off. It's how they were handled and the lack of the communication. But I think one of the most shocking things that came out of it is we were able to watch the financial analysts continually change their um, numbers around how many layoffs were expected for 2023. And so at one point, the initial number early or late summer was they were thinking we were going to have somewhere between 150 and 250 layoffs by the end of October. That number got revised into 100,000 a quarter um, between now and then. The number in October was revised to, in some cases, we're seeing 150,000 a month expected between now and the end of October. And so the number of layoffs are going to continue, unfortunately. Like I hate to be like Debbie Downer, but that's truly what is about to happen. We're, We're going to see it jump into other areas 
And beyond layoffs, what we're also seeing is people not getting raises and increases in the way that they did. So even if they do have their job, they're earning less um, than what the cost of living increases have impacted. And there's a lot of conversation. Obviously, we had a great jobs report in January, and it was really focused on, you know, we added 500,000 jobs and, you know, the wages are up 4.4%, which is all great numbers until you see kind of the number of layoffs, the type of jobs that are existing versus the skills of those that are getting laid off. And then the cost of living increase, you know, I will love to see somebody show me their grocery bill that hasn't gone up more than 20%, let alone 4.4% not to mention rent and childcare and tuition. If you have kids in college, um, you know, the cost of living is far more significant than the, the 10% um, that we are the eight to 10% that we're even stating. And I, one of the questions that's been going on in my head, Sarah is so, so I'm an older millennial. And yeah. so I'm going to preface this by saying I've been very fortunate that I've lived during a time when um, the economy has been pretty strong, uh, yeah. probably prior to this, the only other time where things you know started to hit the rails a little bit was the subprime mortgage crisis back in around 2008. Yeah. Having said all that, wh where my mind often goes is that the number one reason I often read about that the tech executives give in particular for why there are massive layoffs is that they overhired. They did. They hired too many people. To what so to what extent, I guess question for you is to what extent can we help prevent or mitigate massive layoffs from happening in the future by being maybe smarter on the front end in terms of how and what we're hiring for? I think there's two things. Obviously, we have very clear record profits. You know, you're having record profits and doing layoffs at the same time, there's something going on there that is beyond just overhiring. I think on the other side, we did overhire in part because a lot of companies weren't sure exactly what was going to happen, what the bounce back from the recession from COVID was going to be. And so they saw this kind of like the immediate bounce back and they assumed that was going to be continuing on an ongoing basis. A lot of the economists and people that we talked to pre-COVID were actually expecting a small recession to be hitting. And then COVID hit kind of when they were starting. And so we've now got a couple, you know, there's a lot of different factors and people that are way above my pay grade specialize in all of this. But the, the overhiring from conversations we've had from a lot of the organizations and we've talked to a lot of the, um, you know, like the social CEOs who maybe didn't handle it so well, we've reached out and talked to them. We've talked to large organizations, small companies really across the board. The overhiring happened in, for two reasons. One, there were some incentives to hire people. They thought using those incentives, they can actually hire and the pay increased significantly because of some of the incentives that were available and they thought by having more people, they were going to be able to offset and actually grow more, where a lot of the um, profit and revenue growth has been based off of inflating the prices, not actually selling more stuff. And so there's all, yeah, there's just a whole big mess around this. And a, I mean, we would need five or six hours for me to talk through all of my feelings on this and I'll make a bunch of people mad. But how do we prevent it in the future? I mean, I think we just have to be aware of, you know, first and foremost of overhiring and why we're doing this. There's technology available now. There's some really amazing workforce planning and um, workforce analytics type of tools that you can do some of the most advanced forecasting that I've ever seen, not just around your financial revenues and that side of it, but also looking at what that's going to mean for the number of employees. So are you going to need to add headcount? If so, where? How does that look? Who do you already have in your organization that's going to be able to backfill this? Things that used to take months to be able to do manually, you could now do in a matter of seconds. And so the, the technology is newer, but it is definitely being adopted. It is actually a little bit better 
um, the stuff coming out of Europe, but they've now jumped into the US. The other thing that we should be doing, quite honestly, is focusing on reskilling. These jobs, as you said, are going to come out of nowhere. That means everybody has a fair chance to learn how to do them, quite honestly. And yet we're not really focused on reskilling our current workforce. In fact, there was a very large tech company this week that had one of the worst layoff announcements that I've ever seen. And I'm not going to name names, but they announced a new partnership for Super Bowl with um, celebrities. In the next paragraph, they announced a layoff that was coming. And then in the final paragraph, they announced that they were still going to be hiring and actually growing for the rest of the year. And so all in one, right? And so we're seeing this type of messaging happen over and over. And, and when we were doing our layoff research, we found a huge number of organizations were actually laying people off and then asking them to apply for jobs as if they were external candidates. They were not allowed to move internally. They were not offering talent deployment. They weren't offering internal mobility for any of the roles. And if they opted to take a role internally, they had to waive all rights to a future severance if that role was cut. Wow. And this is very, very large, very large tech companies. Um, and so they're they're being designed to skip this. So we have this. It We actually just closed our big insights at work study. We do this once a year. It includes leadership as well as HR and individual contributors. So everybody has different paths to take on it. And we're really looking at what is happening at work from the employee perspective, from HR's perspective, from a business leader's perspective. And one of the things that we ask about is, and it literally just closed. So this is the first starting point for any of the research announced. But um, we ask a question about if you're going to be hiring this year and the number was astounding of how many companies said they were going to be hiring this year. And then we started looking at the same companies and the same numbers, about 20% of the companies that said they are going to be hiring this year also said they're going to be doing layoffs this year. And so you have these organizations that are just not even looking at how to take the employees they already have and move them into other roles. And on the employee side of our research and in some of the write-ins, we had multiple people say, I was laid off from my job. They didn't even give me the option to move into another role. Somebody literally said, we're called talent until we actually get hired. And then our skills are no longer necessary, except for in that one particular job we have. And so when other opportunities come up, we're pigeonholed in whatever they put us in, and we are no longer talent to the organization that hired us. And it was a really kind of a profound comment because it's so true how we do that. And it's no more evident than we talk about it from a layoff perspective and in talent redeployment. That's mind boggling. So I guess the, the big question then, Sarah, following up with that is yeah. why are organizations doing that? Is it because they don't have a reskilling plan? And so it's just we're not sure how to handle this. So we're just going to lay off people and then post brand new positions. Yes. Is it because they, that is the reason why? That tends to be the majority of what we heard is wow. it's going to take too big of a hassle to try to figure out how to move these people into other roles. We don't have the technology or we don't have the process or we don't have the setup. It's going to be easier, which the cost to a business to do a severance package and actually lay somebody off is very expensive. It is not a low cost thing to do, especially so many of the layoffs skip the WARN Act. And so you have to give people, you know, 60 day notice. And so in lieu of doing that, some of the severance packages we are seeing come out of tech run upwards of 12 to 18 months. Wow. They're massive. We've never seen anything like this before. Um, the average that we're seeing is closer to four to nine months. And so we're, these are still exceptionally long packages, which tell me they don't think these people are going to be back within 12 months. Yet at the same time, they're saying they're hiring and in some cases have thousands of openings. And the biggest gap that we continue to hear is they don't know how to know what these people could or should do. And so they want that kind of unicorn candidate that has exactly the perfect experience, which ends up costing so much more than just taking the people that already work for your organization and moving them over. 
Yeah. And the other thing that comes to mind for me is I've seen a lot of stuff. I've read a lot of stuff recently, particularly from Susan Cantrell. Yeah. At Deloitte on how are we going to construct tasks and work in the future? And I wonder if we're at that point now where instead of us thinking about a traditional job description or a specific type of role, are we now at kind of like that turning point where we need to start thinking in terms of skills, in terms of task demands? And then I I guess a a follow-up to that question is, if we go that direction, do we know what is needed for the <laughs> tasks and demands of the future? Can, no. we, can we pull out a crystal ball and, and kind of predict where that's going to fall? No, there's going to be a lot of people trying to, but I think the biggest demand is really going to be the ability for continuous learning. And so there has to be a willingness to learn. There was a few years ago, a very large manufacturing facility that was slated to enter into a Midwestern town. I'm not going to call it out or what it was. And we kind of got contacted because they were needing to hire about 12,000 people uh, in an area that had very high unemployment. And they were going to actually pay them to train for two years as the plant was getting built, they were going to compensate all these people to work for two years. And then they were going to be able to come on full time. And the two year compensation, their training was completely paid. And they were going to be making about 80% of what they would be after the fact, but full benefits for everything else. They actually had to pull the plant because they couldn't find people that were willing to train. Even getting fully paid with full benefits at the same rate and a guaranteed job. Um, And the pay was significantly above market for the region. And we have seen a number of other instances where there are a certain group that just doesn't want to retrain. Like they've kind of like, I'm at this point in my career, I don't want to start over. And some of the conversations we even had during the layoff um, research was with people that were laid off And did have the option to move into another one. And they said, no, like, I'm too old. I don't want to do this now. I don't want to. And by old, some of them were in their forties. Like if they were by no, (laughs) by no rule at all old, they just were like, I know what I'm doing. I know how to do it. I don't want to have to do it a different way. We're seeing this with the chat GPT conversation. If you read the feeds on LinkedIn, the number of people that are like, we never should use this. I don't want to use this. This feels like cheating. Um, and I'm like, do you use a calculator? Because, you know, do you spell check? Do you use Grammarly? It's all the same type of stuff. And, um, you know, there's there's often a resistance. So one of the other things that we find in our research as we dive into buyer behavior, specifically around HR technology, is there's a very high level of resistance from people that are at the VP level and up on new and innovative systems. That hesitation and pause or even pushback and canceling projects only increases if their junior level employees actually fully understand what that technology does. I got to ask this question. Why Why would the senior level leaders object to advanced technology? If they, when we've dove into more qualitative conversations around this, right? Like the data says one thing we, it's been consistent. So this has been a consistent trend that I've seen for about 12 years. And so it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, but it's been consistent um, for actually now, I guess, 14 years. So what we get told is their job is at risk if they don't understand what the technology does and their team understands it because then they are kind of behind and they don't want the perception of being behind. So as long as the technology doesn't come in and they do things the more traditional way, they fully understand, they know how that works. They're clear on what those expectations are. And then they can make sure that they could stay on top of it and they don't have to learn the new technology. That doesn't seem like a good reason. It doesn't. Um, our, you know, as of this morning, uh, out of, you know, we survey thousands of people for this. So out of a thousand active buyers, 
the pushback and senior leadership not understanding the technology is one of the top five reasons why technology is not getting bought and implemented in business today. So I've got to ask follow up to that because that just blows my mind. I did not right. know that. That's that's one of the things today already you've taught me um, that I'm going to have to unlearn in my brain is <sighs> I, I presume know. that the top level leaders were the ones that were leading the transformation and change. So if they're not, if that's the struggle, how how do you equip them? How do we equip organizations to be able to change, to be able to put together digital transformation strategies right. so that they're not left behind? So it's not, obviously it's not all, it's just a good percentage of them enough that it's having a broader impact. So I don't want to lump everybody. It's just a higher percentage at that level. Um, we actually do see that C-suite is more apt to support this than the VP level is. It's an anomaly at the VP level across all industries. Okay. And it has not necessarily changed that much as generations have moved in and out of that VP level. And so there's just this one kind of strip. But what we can do and what we have been doing and, and have seen a big shift on is really around how we talk about technology and demystifying it. So if we can take something that like AI or chat GPT or any of these other tools and we can stop talking about them with buzzwords and you know trying to make them so complicated and we could just make it really simple, it lessens the anxiety for buyers across the board. And this is true of every single size organization, every single industry in the US and Europe, in Australia, our survey is global. And so we see that this one thing about talking about it in a more simple way actually reduces the fear and helps them understand. Unfortunately, a lot of marketing teams and a lot of salespeople have been taught that if they can make something seem confusing and then their product is what makes it simple to solve it, mm. they're going to, right? That's kind of an old school yeah. model of marketing and selling. But what we've learned is that actually doesn't work. Um, it, it's getting pushed back quite a bit. And by helping them understand and even minimizing like, yeah, we use AI, it just helps us do this. But here's how it actually impacts your business. Here's how it's gonna make your job simpler. Um, the top reason for buying technology, HR technology, recruiting technology, anything to do with work tech right now is actually for efficiency. Mm -hmm. The second reason is to make life easier for the employees. Cost is saving money is way down the list. And so we always think people are buying technology in order to like cut costs and save money. They're actually just trying to make life easier for their employees in a lot of cases. And so two out of the top three purchasing decisions are around improving the employee experience or making life simpler for teams to be able to get their jobs done in less time. I think what you just shared there, Sarah, every single CEO needs to be contacting Aspect 43 <laughs> for you to be the mouthpiece of how to communicate digital transformation strategy effectively to people to help them understand the motivations behind it. Like you just said, it's yeah. not just to cut costs or to take people's jobs. It's to become more efficient and help people do their jobs better. Right. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. That does not surprise me that your research validates that, that communication uh, in, in terms of why digital transformation is needed just falls flat. Um, yeah. But it's also good to know that we can get it corrected. Um, if we yeah. do focus on how to communicate that message as eloquently as you just put it, um, we can get more people on board and ready to embrace the change that's needed for the future of work. And with that, we're going to take a real quick break. Um, we're at the bottom of the hour. We are with the CEO of Aspect 43 Research Firm, Sarah White, today. We're unpacking massive layoffs, um, how to do them ethically, um, how to still have a positive employee experience amidst that, and then how the heck do we prepare? Uh, for the future, for jobs we don't even know are going to exist yet. We're unpacking all that uh, with her today. We're going to take a quick two-minute break to hear a couple messages from our sponsors. And on the flip side, Sarah, just to tee things up a little bit, give you a little bit of think time. When we come back, let's talk about survivor syndrome. You talk about this in your research. Let's talk about survivor syndrome for the folks who are still there working even after 15, 20% of their colleagues are let go. 
So yeah. with that, we'll be back in two minutes. For most of us, change is freaking terrifying. And unfortunately, there's no app to adapt. That might change in the not so distant future. But for now, we're on our own. That means we can either accept our default future or reimagine our tomorrow. For those of you who choose default, good luck. Just remember, there's no pause button for change. You can't turn back the clock. And there's no get out of jail free card in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Like it or not, change will happen all around us. And that change is not becoming just more disruptive and frequent, but volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, or VUCA. Fortunately, you can make change work for you and turn it into your personal and competitive advantage. Reimagine your future to one in which you're living with purpose, you're happy, and you're growing, thriving, and flourishing. If you're ready to rewrite your next life chapter and regain control of your destiny in this never normal world, your journey starts here. Contact the leader in adaptability and making change work for you, your team, and your organization. Ira S. Wolf, adaptability.expert. There's a certain kind of coach who believes what we believe, who leads people to greatness, who gets people unstuck, who unlocks all of your passion, a coach who helps people discover what drives them to tap into their superpowers, that knowing your why is the first step to untap potential, to focus to breakthroughs, a coach who's looking for a better way. Are you that coach? And welcome back, everybody, to Geek Skeezers Googleization. We're with Sarah White today. Thank you, Sarah, for taking the time with us. That first half went extraordinarily quickly, and we covered a lot of ground. And right before we hit that break, I teased something a little bit from your research that also was a brand new thing for me, and that's this concept of survivor syndrome. So tell us what survivor syndrome is when we're talking about layoffs and what can leaders do to help with it? I think there's two different areas of where we're really seeing survivor syndrome impact. The first is the people that actually have to deliver the news about the layoff. Um, hmm. This seemed to be a huge factor. We talked to a handful of people that were not in HR, that were not necessarily the managers, but they were literally tapped on the shoulder and told they had to do these layoffs with less than a 30 minute notice. Here's a script. Here's what you have to say. Don't go off script. Don't say a word. Here's the list of people you have to tell. And in some cases, these are their colleagues, their coworkers. They're trying to process. They don't know, you know, from the car conversation, they don't know if are they next right? When they get done doing all these layoffs, is somebody going to come talk to them? They have no idea about what's happening with their own job. And they just were not mentally prepared because they had no idea this was coming. Because as I mentioned, a lot of the companies that have been doing layoffs lately have opted to do the severance program instead of the actual notices ahead of time. What we have found can be done very simply is just having a conversation and giving people the time to mentally prepare for that. And then also uh, providing some services, whether it's through an EAP or a counselor for the people that did do that in order just to have the conversations. But in either event, letting them know very clearly the impact their role is about to have. Like, are, are they safe? Are they possibly part of it? Are they at risk? Like, they need to know that going in. And they need to have time to actually walk through and talk to somebody about the emotional side of how things can be done. We talked to somebody outside of tech and they actually had to have security at the door because they were laying somebody off and he completely destroyed the room in person. She was wow. basically locked in a room with, you know, she was a, you know, five foot, 110 pound woman who had just been handed all of this over, was not prepared for any of this type of stuff. And it was a 250 pound, six foot three man who literally flipped a table and threw a chair at her. And she's trying to get security in. She doesn't know what to do. Nobody prepared her. 
she, she had no idea they didn't have any notice for it. Like it was, there's a lot of those stories that we heard. And so there's that level of survivor's guilt. There's the other flip side of just people that just made the cut, right? Like they don't know why, like, why am I here? And my friends that I have lunch with every day aren't what is happening next. My whole team. Um, I remember one of my first layoffs that I was involved with my entire team was let go except for me. Wow. You know, what do you do? Right. I'm, I marched in. I'm like, well, can I just get a severance package since everyone else gets, gets to leave? I don't want to be here now. I don't want to be the sole survivor when you bring in all new leadership and management and do all of this and rebuild. Um, and so you, you have to make sure if you're really focused on employee experience, you have to focus on the employee experience of those that are leaving, but you also have to focus on the ones that are staying. Who's picking up all the slack for the work that's left? Are they prepared? Are you giving people the time to transition projects? Do you even know, does, did the leaders running the projects get let go? There was a conversation I had as part of this research where somebody that had been re running a project for a decade was let go. Nobody on her team knew any of the stuff on how to actually run the project. Wow. She started it, she ran it, manage all the teams. They're trying to struggle to even see who globally is on all of these teams in order to kind of piece it together of what this is, where the project is at, what's outstanding. You know, she was a, a individual contributor, but ran a very large cross-functional team. So getting back to, you know, what we were talking about, the skills and how jobs are changing, we're already seeing them change, but they're not changing in a way. And then you have all the people surviving. Well, did I say something that maybe got her fired? Did I say something to HR? Did I say something to a leader? Did I drop the ball on a project that we both worked on and they thought it was this person? And so there's all of these conversations that are going through when there's a lack of clear communication with both the people that are leaving and the people that are saying how decisions are made, why decisions are made, um, making it in a really clear and direct way. And I think it's important to know, you know, you're elder millennial. I am like the eldest. I think we used to be called Gen Y. So I'm like right on that border age. Um, a third of the people in the workforce right now we're in high school or elementary school during our last recession. Mm, yeah. They have no concept for this, right. right? They they do not have, you know, by the time if you came out of college or you were in internships, let's say 2001, you've gone through 01, 08. If you were in tech, probably 12, 14, again in 20, like you've gone through the series of downsizes and layoffs and downsizes. Like it's been like, oh yeah, this is just what happens. Um, even though before 1970, like they were almost unheard of, right? Like it was before the seventies, large scale layoffs like this were almost unheard of, but we've gotten to where they become so normalized. And then as you mentioned, having a 12 year run, where we really haven't seen large scale layoffs short of a global pandemic. Um, it, it's just a very different dynamic. And it's why we see some of the people turning to things like TikTok and social media channels, not LinkedIn, but sharing like what is what it is, helping share, like find people jobs, build out different connections, talk about telling people not to come to the organization because of how layoffs are handled. We're about to see 10 years of employee experience and employment brand investment destroyed in six months, wow. not to mention the impact on DEI um, at a lot of these organizations, because believe it or not, a number of the HR leaders we've talked to were not aware of even how the list of who was getting cut was made. So let I've got, there's so much there. Let's. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're blowing my mind. No, this it is a good way. It's, it's been a crazy few mind. months of studying this. So so the last part that you just shared there. Yeah. As you were describing this and how there's a lack of communication when it comes to the layoffs and what the strategy is. How much of this is that the organizations are actually doing it haphazardly? Like the position, there is no strategy behind or I shouldn't say no strategy, but maybe a lack of a coherent strategy that's been really thoughtfully planned and that it's more of like a haphazard thing going on. Does that help explain why sometimes it's so disorganized and handled so poorly? 
I think so. I think there's that. I think other times um, they're not looking necessarily at the larger picture. They're like, oh, sales are down. We have to cut X number of people, but we're not looking at, okay, if we cut them all from customer service, that's going to negatively impact the customers that we have, which means we might lose more customers. If we cut them from this group, it might, you know, they're just kind of saying we need to do a blanket cut. Uh, you know, one organization I know just basically everybody, it was a first in first out. So they had to cut, just use, for example, 10 people. It was the 10 most recently hired with no matter what their role was or anything else. Um, and so there's, there has not been a lot of thought to this. And I think in part because the technology and the, the factors that actually help us make really good decisions isn't being made. We talked to a number of managers who had no say in who on their team was getting let go. Wow. Um, they were just given a list of, and they, you know, they asked like, where did this list come from? Who made these decisions? Um, and it wasn't even based on performance reviews or anything like that. There no rhyme or reason. And that I think has been one of the things for not just the people that were let go, but for a lot of the people that were staying, that were not even coworkers, but for the leaders of these teams, not knowing how or why these decisions were made and feeling completely like they've lost the power and control of their own team to feel like they could, you know, protect or support or know like that their team was or wasn't even at risk. And you mentioned employer brand too, Sarah, Yeah. that, that uh, many organizations that have been investing heavily in their employer brand could be flushing it down the drain with 100%. these decisions. Yeah. And I also wonder if to a certain extent, the reason we haven't seen positive change at the scale we'd like to see with most organizations in terms of how they, they handle layoffs is because I, I wonder if some of the senior level executives may still have that same mindset of oh, eventually people have to work. They'll have to come back to work as opposed to viewing it through the lens of employer brand. But those days are kind of going by, aren't they? I mean, yeah. eventually everyone who will be part of the workforce is going to care about employer brand or is going to be part of these groups you're talking about where they're trying to get inside information about what it's really like to work there. Well, and I think a lot of leaders have kind of always put like recruiting over in this other area and not realize that employer brand is not just for the new hires. It's for your existing workforce mm. as well, because your, in, your current employees want to feel that they work for a company that they could be proud of and that other people want to work at. We've seen this with certain retail establishments where people, you know, expect to make more money because the brand is bad and they're embarrassed about working there. Um, and so we know there's correlation between pay and all of these other factors with em employment brand. But one of the most interesting things that has come out of our study this year is retention and hiring are still our top two. They have been for, and our factors are not all just HR things. So we ask about the impact of inflation, supply chain, global unrest. We're asking a number of conversations and, and different talking points about what the business is actually worried about. And retention and recruiting have continuously been number one and number two for a number of years, which makes sense. War on talent, skill shortage, all of these conversations that we've had. Last year, recruiting outpaced, I'm sorry, retention outpaced recruiting for the very first time. Wow for 2022. This year, the gap increased to a 13% gap for outpacing um, retention versus ups recruiting with upskilling moving from 20% to 40% urgency. Wow. And concern. And so this whole concept of retention, you know, and, and we're not caring about the brand why do the people, I heard this actually from a, from a CEO, why do the people who stayed cared what happened to the ones that were left, they got to keep their jobs. Like there's, there's a very real disconnect and it's not just in the C-suite. I've heard very similar conversations from HR leaders. I've heard similar conversations from managers on teams and from other employees. Like who cares? I kept my job. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the vast majority of employees do care. And all of these, this talent that is on the market right now, they just went through and experienced this. And so they can see 
how you handled it, it's all public, right? And that's the biggest shift from 2008, 2010 layoffs to today. Social media was so new that it was kind of covered, like there was some stuff, but nowhere near to the degree that all of this is this time. And so it's the first time a lot of these companies are about to see the true impact of their decisions. And the Burning Glass Institute too, uh, they found one of the top four kind of categories of skills in the future of work is social media. Yeah. Um, those particular skills are becoming more important for organizations. And I can't help but think that part of the reason for that is what your research is showing is that there's no more hiding. It's public. What, yeah. uh, you know, your different people strategies, uh, your employment brand, all of those things that have to do with the culture and the people side of the business is no longer hidden. One of the things you just shared, Sarah, that gives me hope and optimism that we will eventually get to a place where hopefully we no longer have mass layoffs is yeah. that, that, uh, that stat you shared where the reskilling moved from 20% up to 40% yes. in terms of interest and recognizing a need to, to build that strategy. That way we get out of the, the muck and mire of mass layoffs, but at the same time having hundreds or thousands of open positions available. Right. That does give me hope and optimism for the future. Well, a couple more questions before we get to our lightning okay. round. I've got, we, we've started touching a little bit on um, the AI side of things a little bit. And so I've got to ask you kind of an open-ended question. How are you using chat GPT? <laughs> we actually, um, we went through and we tested about 14 of the paid products and did the exact same test cases on all of them just to see which ones were good, which ones weren't. Um, we found two that were worth investing in. Other than those, they couldn't even come close to what chat GPT was already doing for free. And so I think that that's something first off people should be aware of. The second thing is where what we have found with chat GPT is that how you ask the question greatly impacts the quality of the response you get. And so you can go in and ask a question and you're going to get a very generic response, which is something that I commonly see people talking about on LinkedIn. And they're like, oh, I tried it. It gave me back, you know, a generic thing, the same as everybody else. And what we found um, with playing it with it for a little bit, after about two hours, we understood kind of the way it wanted to be asked. Um, no different than back in the day where we had to learn like Boolean to properly ask questions on, um, I think at that point it was Ask Jeeves, um, going way back, probably before your time, but looking at this type of stuff and finding that we were able to do one person's job in about four hours. Wow. For the month, one person's job for the month. We were wow. able to do in about four hours once we knew how to ask the right questions. Yeah. And um, even with the smaller stuff where we still have not seen it successful at all, which is weird because it's what the big conversation about is about rewriting. Like I don't see this replacing blog posts anytime soon or long form content or anything like that where it's very strong though. Um, and where we've really enjoyed is as, you probably can imagine I sometimes get long-winded. So I'll take what I write, a couple of paragraphs, and I'm like, can you make this more concise? Or can you give me five different ways to say this and out pops five different versions of what I said? Not adding anything, not necessarily changing the tone of anything, just making it a little bit clearer. And it's been phenomenal and it's been great. That's awesome. I actually stumped it today. I use it every single day. And today was the first time that I actually stumped it where it just sat there blinking at me and couldn't provide a response. And the question was, how do we solve the teacher shortage crisis? It doesn't have an answer. And That's that just goes it. to show we still need people. We're always going to need people to really solve the yeah. complex problems. Um, but it really is exciting to see a lot of the efficiencies, like you talked about, exactly. the AI is going to bring to the table to free up more of our people's, our knowledge workers, mental resources to be innovators and bring value to the market and, and value added change. Well, one more question. The final okay. one I've got to ask before we get to the lightning round is 
What's something I should have asked you today that I did not? I think one of the challenges and things that we need to think about just in general is why we're seeing such a big disconnect between really positive job report numbers, really, um, you know, a market that's moving in the right direction. And yet on the other side, we are seeing so many people in this country struggling. The gap is widening so much that the disconnect now is not at people that are millionaires and up. It's at people that are at the 250 range for household, 200,000 per household are, are not seeing what is actually happening. I think with a lot of the um, workers, you know, a huge percentage of workers, households in this country make under a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so when things increase, um, you know, when cost of living is going up 10 to 15%, but wages are only going up three to 4%. And they're like, it's not that big of a deal. Groceries are a little bit more. It's a little bit more for people that are upper middle class, where that divide used to feel a lot greater on broader scales. And I think that's something that we're going to have to figure out as a, you know, as a country, specifically in the U.S., um, and really look at how we are managing work. Um, pay, same day pay, pay equity is one of the things our next big, after our, our research publishes, our next big report is on pay equity and on continuous pay. And there's a big gap between leaders at organizations thinking this is important and needs of the workforce. Um, and, you know, we just looked at this number today, it was over 30% of managers and up don't know why an employee would possibly want to have access to their earned wages same day. Wow. The self-reported. We don't know why this doesn't make sense to us. Why somebody would want this. Another 20% flat out said, we're just not interested. Nobody would ever care for this. Wow. And so, and so this, this disconnect of um, socioeconomic status is happening at professional level roles. It is not frontline workers. It is not hospitality workers. It is not minimum wage workers. It is people that are working inside the exact same organization, just in different roles at the same tech companies, at the same um, businesses, same manufacturing things. It, it's something that I think is going to really be something we're going to have to watch over the next two years. Well, and I think you just teed up the next conversation that we need to have later this year. If you'd be willing to come back on is let's dig into that once you have your research, because you're absolutely right. Uh, that's what I typically hear from folks is, are we in a recession? Are we not? I'm getting conflicting messages here. There's so much cognitive dissonance going on. The Matthew effect between the haves and the have not seems yeah. to get wider. So yeah, that sounds like a fascinating topic that we should cover next time that we have you on later this year, but uh, we're going to get right into our lightning round. So we're okay. just going to ask you two or three questions to get to know you a little bit better on a personal okay. level. And then we'll, we'll wrap things up. And so let's start with this one, Sarah. Um, if there was one person in the history of the world that you could spend the day with, who would it be? Oh, this is like the hardest question ever. Well, we can try another one and come back. Let's to that do one. another one. Let me come back to that. Okay. How about a favorite food? Pizza. Yeah, you can't go wrong with pizza. Cold, hot. What are your favorite toppings? Um, just straight up margarita pizza. Um, Italy style, just like a little bit of fresh oil and fresh basil on top. Just super simple, no toppings. Nice. And uh, how about this one? And then we'll come back to the the person. Um, <laughs> Unless there's uh, a number four and skip the person. I haven't thought of one yet. Okay. That's right. Yeah, we can we can skip that okay. one too. How about if there was one place in the world that you could go, where would it be? Um, Amalfi Coast. And I'm going in five weeks. So nice. it's been on my bucket list. So I'm super excited. Um, we are going in a few weeks. I love that. Well, it's, and it looks beautiful. It does. Absolutely. I'm jealous. And Ira's in Hawaii. So that definitely yes. exciting for him. So I got a happy, happy birthday to him. Here. That's right. Happy birthday, Ira. Um, this one has to do with the bucket list. So you mentioned one thing that's on your bucket list. Can you okay. share another item that's on your bucket list? 
Um, oh gosh, you just stumped me on all of this stuff. I've been a mom for so many years. Like everything is about what my kids want. Um, right. I totally get it. I think the other thing that's on my bucket list is um, probably living abroad for a couple of years and just really getting to immerse in some other cultures and do, um, you know, when I say immerse in other, I just really mean eat. I just want to like eat my way through <laughs> Europe for a year. <laughs> I'll be honest. I love that's it. it. That's, I love it. that's my favorite part about going over there is just like, I love the culture. I love how different it is. It's the same in the U.S. I love traveling the U.S. and seeing all of the different cultures and all the amazing food that is in all parts of this world. I love it. You know, for all the talk of how complex creatures we are, human beings as a species, isn't it fascinating that for almost everyone, the top thing they want to do is travel, yeah. right? You want, to, you want to have the food. You want to have the good drinks. You want to see the cool places. Um, I think that's one thing that we all kind of share in common. Well, Sarah, yeah. we can't thank you enough for coming on today's show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Serious insights. Um, Aspect43.com is where you can find more information. And the name of the study that they just came out with is from the winter of 2023 is Ethical Layoffs, yeah. Employee Experience During Rifts. And you got to hear some of those insights today. Any other ways uh, for folks to get in touch with you, Sarah, and learn about the work you're doing at Aspect yeah, 43? I think this is uh, kind of great. I think you can also pre-register for the our insights at work research. Sorry, my daughter just came Your home. Your compadre is ready to, to sign up. Yeah, sorry about that. But you can find that on there. Awesome. Um, and pre-register for that research. Sounds great. Sarah, thanks again for joining us. And we definitely would love to have you back on again in the future and tackle the, the equity and pay conversation too when you've got the research. Thank you so much. Well, folks, there you go. We covered a lot and I know we're up against it on time. Um, totally worth it though. Anytime that we can get Sarah to come on, um, not just opinion, but data research from uh, consumers, from workers, from senior, suite, uh, senior level, C-suite level leaders inside organizations on what's going on with the massive layoffs. And we covered a lot today. So I encourage you to go back and whenever the podcast version of the show is released, go back, um, re-listen to it. Lots of good things in there. For me, uh, there were several aha moments, things that I was totally unaware of. But the biggest one was the fact that so many uh, vice president level leaders inside organizations are hesitant with change when it comes to digital transformation strategy and trying to rethink and prepare for the future in terms of roles, skills, jobs, uh, bringing on technology that can help the, the organization adapt and prepare for the future. And so that definitely is something where we've got to do a better job of communicating. And as Sarah pointed out, this was another aha. The primary reason that the senior level executives want to bring on AI and machine learning. It is not to reduce costs. It is not to eliminate people from working there. It's for these two reasons that Sarah shared. Number one, increase efficiencies. Number two is improve the employee experience for the people who work there. And so please keep that in mind. Anytime you hear Folks say AI and machine learning is just simply to replace people. No, it's not. Now, the primary reasons it's being brought in is to increase efficiency and improve the employee experience. People will always be the most valuable part of any organization. So with that, we want to thank you for tuning in today, Googleization Nation. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, please do so. Um, you can also go to our website, geekskeezersgooglization.com. Learn about our Googleization Nation community, which is totally free, where you can get advanced screenings, additional resources, and things related to the show. And as always, we want to thank you for tuning in and helping us be in the top 1% in the world. And that's all because of you and our fabulous guests like we had today, Sarah. So next time, Ira will be back from vacation. He'll be nice and tan and well-rested. And so we'll look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. Until then, don't let the shift hit your plans. <laughs>